I mean, I imagine there's there's this point in not too far in the future where because the software, the AI is it's ramping really fast, especially really recently. Uh, there's a couple of things, capabilities that if you get them, you can make some pretty dramatic changes uh, to a factory. One of them is is having reliable spatial awareness, like having a bunch of cameras in a factory and the camera just knowing where everything is in inside the factory, right? So in, uh, maybe maybe you've got an overall controller, maybe individual robots have a set of cameras around there, but they know where they are and they know what they're supposed to be. And so that's one thing. The other is spatial planning. Um, I mean, planning as a is a not a difficult thing if you uh, if you're able to create the problem if you're able to define the problem in a particular way. But um, new AI techniques are allowing much more efficient uh, planning. What well, planning is basically searching through the space of like what sequence of things can I do to get a particular result and like you know, essentially planning all the different sequences that you could do to pick the ones that are like most efficient or safest or optimizing for whatever you want, instead of having to search the tree of, pro of possibilities, which is that's like the classic way of, of doing it. Neural networks introduce this possibility, kind of like in Go playing, where you don't have to play out all the different possibilities in order to figure out what a, a good outcome is. The, a neural network gets trained up so it has a pretty good sense of where to start. And as it works its way through the process, it knows things that probably aren't going to. So essentially, it prunes, it pre prunes a tree for you and can much more quickly this, uh, you know, get a set of planning. So if you have good spatial perception and you have good planning, now the dynamic of the robots that we have in the factory, I mean, robots we have in factories today, they're kind of a compromise between like full automation, like the, the bottling factory, where it only makes bottles and can't do anything. Uh, if you if you want your factory to be a little bit more flexible, but you want to buy a mass produced robot where you just get a bunch, well, then you can, you know, an arm is kind of the simplest thing that can be mass produced. You get one that's a certain size, has a certain, you know, scale that that it can work at. You get it in your factory and it can substitute for all these custom machines. Potentially, it wouldn't be as fast. It might not be as cheap. Um but it's flexible, so you can get your factory up quickly, and you can, and your factory now becomes adaptable because people can go in, reprogram the robots, you can make changes. It's much more flexible than the bottling factory is, right? Uh, but a big constraint on how we use those robots right now is that they're basically blind, as Scott's mentioned before, right? You have to figure out exactly what all the precise movements are, and the way the robots have to be made. The, the, the reason that there's these giant hulking things is because in order to get precision, you have to make the robot arm incredibly stiff because it doesn't have any feedback aside from the stepper motors are saying, yeah, you're at that angle when, you know, the arm knows it's at this position because it's blind. So one of the other things spatial awareness gets you is now the robot arms, they have visual feedback on what they're doing. Potentially they have visual feedback on what they're doing. So now the robot arms get a lot cheaper. Like, because you don't have to make them as stiff. They can be much, much lighter. You achieve your precision through feedback rather than precision by making a precision machine. So now the robot arms, they get the, a robot arm that does the same thing gets smaller, it gets lighter, you can put more of them in a space. When you have spatial awareness, there's another trick that you can do. Like right now we bolt the robots to the floor. You don't want them to move. Once you got them programmed relative to the fixtures, like you don't want them to, to move. You got spatial awareness and feedback. You put them all on wheels, <laughs> right? So you you know when you're getting your when you're getting your cell set up, they you know you spread the cell out. They all get doing their thing, and then you can gradually optimize the thing by just telling them all to move closer. Your factory becomes more reconfigurable because instead of having, you know, your flexible robots all bolted in spots, you know, with fixed spacing and all that kind of stuff, they can they 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 become dynamically configurable. So. Once we, and it's not, we're not that far away from having good spatial awareness and a good ability to plan and prune a tree uh, in, uh, to do this kind of stuff. So I can imagine like this intermediate before we get to the alien dreadnought, getting to a factory that is a lot more flexible than the factories that we have right now uh, in, in terms of being able to be dynamic and optimize itself and, and flexible to, you know, to its inputs, its outputs, its run rate, all that kind of stuff. And I think AI gets us that probably pretty soon now. Like this is not 50 years in the future. This is 10, maybe. Kind From of a time sensor frame. standpoint, is that the spatial awareness down to say millimeter or even sub millimeter accuracy, is that something that we can get from vision or do we need oh, yeah. LIDAR and other sensors yeah. in order to get that level of accuracy? Vision is, is 
cameras are unbelievably good. Now you, of course, if you want, you know, if you want to be able, if you got a big robot arm and you want to position it down to, you know, millimeter or sub millimeter accurate accuracy, you do have this overall problem that, you know, it has vibrational modes and you have feedback controls. And I mean, there are certain mechanical constraints on being able to do that. But, you know, if you put a camera on the end of the robot arm and it's got a microscope that looks at that tip, to, you know, to, you know, you can get your feedback, your positional feedback to whatever precision that you want. I mean, we, you know, I integrated circuits, we do positional feedback literally down to like the five nanometers or something like that. Like we know how to do that in terms of the optics, the cameras, you know, that, so the, the, the actuators are a little more complicated and they're mechanical limitations, but, uh, but getting that just from a sense standpoint is that like the sense sensors, I, and one of the reasons that it's, a lot of this is taking a while is because cameras are such a great sensor, but they're so hard to process. Like if you've done, I mean, I'm sure Scott's worked on automation processes where you have a camera and, you know, if you're using traditional vision algorithms, you know, you kind of get the thing working and then somebody changes the light bulb in the factory, right? I mean, literally things like a light bulb changing or a light bulb burning out or a blinking LED someplace, you know, you tune up these algorithms and traditional uh, vision algorithms, they can be pretty brittle, but you know, neural networks, a little more training, you know, and they can deal with all this noise and subjectivity, you know, in the environment and still operate normally. And, you yeah, know, the up. other, we're, uh, the other really exciting thing that we're, we're just starting to learn this recently. And like the possibility has been there for a long time, but we're starting to see people actually do it is be able to, to have these, uh, self-supervised large models you use to do planning in an environment. And it so happens that the way that we've discovered this capability is through large language models. So you get this thing where you've got language integrated with planning suddenly. Like Google has demonstrated this on a couple of big models now where, where essentially without training a robot, uh, you know, a specific set of motions, you can use a language model, a couple, you know, some actuators and, uh, and some other, you know, world modeling and a vision model. And all of a sudden the, the system, it becomes general enough that you can give it instructions like verbally in English. Uh, and it can actually put together a plan and turn that into a set of motions for ro ro for actuators. And the fact that that's doable now for, for with systems that aren't even really designed to do it, like the, because the, the AI has got to that level of generality, like it seems really likely that, that, that sooner rather than later, we're going to get to the point where Scott can go, where, you know, you can get rid of all the barriers and Scott can have his, you know, KUKA robot arms or whatever the deal is, whatever they have at that particular point in time. And, you know, and instead of having to show the robot, you tell the robot what to do. I was like, put the welder down here and I want you to run a thing like that. So just that training gets a lot easier once your planning is getting done by an AI and your interface is, is at the sort of, is, is at a much more abstracted level inside the thing They're like this is great there's so many great things are going to happen with this stuff in the next mm -hmm. few years